Twelve fateful months had ended. As the dying year merged into the new, it was a time of reflection. In a year where crisis followed crisis, sport provided the antidote. And so the varsity boat race, which ended in the 49th win for Cambridge, opened the big sporting events of 1947. In cricket, Dennis Compton, here scoring a century in the first South African test, broke all run-getting records. While England won the tests, racehorses from overseas won the classics. Grand national honours went to Ireland. Kahu was the first to pass the post at odds of 66 to 1. But Britain had successes in other fields. John Cobb set up a new world land speed record. A 2,600 horsepower Railton Special reached 400 miles an hour, one mile in less than nine seconds. More than 20 million people watched the year's football. 80,000 went to Wembley for the cup final between white-shirted Charlton and Burnley. Chris Duffy scored the goal in extra time which gave Charlton the cup. And so to Tattenham Corner for the derby. The favourite Tudor minstrel, ridden by champion jockey Gordon Richards, was way behind, and French-owned Pearl Diver was way out in front. Pearl Diver won four lengths ahead. Victory by a 40-to-1 outsider brought the bookies five million pounds. Yet sport was but the tinsel in a year of destiny for the world. For only time could mark the place in history of this perplexed era. Here in the British Museum are housed five million books, books which tell the story of man's achievements and failures through the ages. And it'll be among these great records of the world's story that this Pathé Newsreel will be preserved as a pictorial chronicle of our times. And what has this record for posterity? For six grim years, men fought for an ideal. In truth, it was a war of ideologies. The tragedy of 1947 was in a different key. While the nations conferred, the political skirmishing went on. For the democracies of the West, Britain's Hector McNeil had this to say. Our designs are plain, our doors are open, our press, our people and our parliament are free. For the totalitarianism of Soviet Russia, Vyshinsky persistently maintained that the Western states were warmongering. The clash between the Soviet creed and Western civilization was on. The Truman Doctrine meant war on communism. Britain finds itself under the necessity of reducing or liquidating its commitments in several parts of the world. In Had the nations learned the lessons of the recent war? That was the question. The answer did not make easy reading. In Palestine, fighting had already begun. Partition had brought Arab and Jew to grips. In Europe, communist-inspired unrest had paralyzed French industry. By December, it was clear the tactics had failed but they had brought France near to a semi-fascist regime. Propaganda emanating from the common form met with some success. In Italy, the communists cashed in on economic difficulties. Once again, their attempt to achieve results before American aid could come to the rescue had failed, but time was short. Recovery for Europe was also dependent upon German prosperity. The failure of the foreign ministers to agree on German unification would mean a divided country, and the return to vigor of a demoralized people would take longer to achieve. For the British Commonwealth, there was no Cold War. By mutual agreement, Burma became an independent republic. Two months earlier saw the transfer of power in India. Earl Mountbatten, the last of 21 viceroys, ended 200 years of British rule. The civil war that followed partition brought death to half a million people. India gained freedom at a price. Although final peace between the two new dominions would take time to achieve, the Commonwealth and Empire, by its conduct of domestic affairs, had much to teach the world. In a year of negative political warfare, the one bright gleam was the royal visit to South Africa. 80,000 tribesmen assembled to greet the royal family when they visited Basutoland. In a 12-week tour, the king and queen visited more than 50 places. For Britain and the Dominions, it was the political triumph of the year. And who will historians rate as the man of 1947? 
Many celebrities will want to forget this year. For example, £20,000 footballer Tommy Lawton, who collected too many headlines. And Senora Evita Perón, a fashionable traveller who wasn't welcome everywhere. It was a mixed year, too, for Emmanuel Shinwell, right on coal production, wrong about the fuel crisis. To forget will be Hugh Dalton's wish. Fifty-five careless words cost him a chancellorship. In France, General Charles de Gaulle staged the year's biggest comeback. Success for his party at the municipal polls put him among the men of the year. Vyacheslav Molotov will be remembered as the Kremlin negotiator with whom few could come to terms. In the international field, the honours go to George Marshall, America's Secretary of State. His economic aid programme may be the turning point for Europe. In Britain, Sir Stafford Cripps took top place as the man of the year. His great ability and personal integrity had lifted him above his fellows. The social history books of the future will tell of 1947 as the year that found Britain battling for survival. In domestic affairs, the call for the British people was production. In factory, workshop and home, the cry went out for greater output. Two wars in one generation had deprived Britain of her material assets there remained the spirit of her people. To survive, the nation must work. Industry became the new front line. Men and women workers, the fighters in the new recovery struggle. Results soon came. Steel workers set up output records. Cloth exports were the highest ever. Export targets were set and reached. It was from the coal mines that national recovery would spring. Britain depended on the miners. And by the end of the year, Plans were in hand for exporting coal again. Yet the price of coal production was sometimes high. In a mine explosion at Whitehaven, 104 men were killed. It was the worst disaster of its kind for 37 years. It was a grim year too for Britain's railways. Five major train wrecks cost 83 lives. Fire caused heavy losses in London when a rubber dump blaze lit up the capital. In a country where the weather is always suitable for discussion, it was a year of extremes. The worst weather for 50 years brought snow ups and a fuel crisis. It almost brought the nation's life to a standstill. Following the snow were the worst floods in memory. Disaster struck the Finlands. Hopes of a rich harvest were destroyed. And so arrived the hottest summer for many years. No better tonic could have come to a nation with so many problems to face. As the year moved towards a close, it brought the touch of colour the people so eagerly sought. The girl who would one day be queen married the man of her choice. For Britain and the world, November the 20th was a day of great joy. This wedding, which brought with it national rejoicing, shed its warmth to every corner of the world. For the princess and the bridegroom, it was the start of a new life. For the British people, it was the wedding of one from their own family. That symbol of unity, burning so brightly on a cold November day, is a message of hope. With this hope and the will to work, Britain firmly faces 1948.